Welcome to the Times Union Food Life Live. This is the third in our series. Uh, my name is Susie Davidson Powell. I'm the dining critic for the Albany Times Union. And we are going to be talking today about rosé. And we'll talk about its popularity, especially over the last decade. We'll talk about what it is. We'll talk about skin contact. We'll share some of our favorites. We'll talk about trends from rosé to canned rosé, from rosé, I should say, to canned rosé. And who's drinking it? Who's driving the trend? Are we talking millennials? Are we talking about Generation X? And I'm really excited to introduce my guests. Um, we have actually three guests. We had billed it as two guests, but first I'd like to introduce Heather Levine. Heather Levine, I'm sorry, I've been saying her name wrong for too many years. Heather Levine from uh, originally known to many of you from Clark House Hosp Hospitality in Troy. Um, basically the, the wine guru behind all of the ordering program, 22 Second Street Wine Company in Troy. So Heather, welcome. Um, and in addition, I would like to introduce Anthony Graziano and uh, his wine buyer, uh, another Heather, Heather Dolan. So we didn't have Heather listed, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about them. Both Anthony and Heather are coming to us from the Shaker and Vine, over in Schenectady on the Mohawk Harbor. And when we thought we were gonna talk about rosé, I felt certain it would be a glorious, hot, sunny day, which it was this morning, but it has been pouring with rain ever since. So this should be proof that rosé can be drunk in all weather. So we'll get to that in a minute. But first of all, I want to welcome you all. Um, and I should also just mention, if you have questions, please feel free. We're streaming live on um, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, you can submit your questions at any time and I can get those. And if you're going to direct any specific questions to either of the Heathers, please say Heather Levine in your message or Heather Dolan so we know who to, to forward it to. Um, and so first of all, going to Heather Levine, um, I should say Heather escaped the capital region just before the COVID shutdown. And she is actually coming to us from Celebration, Florida. Correct. That's correct. And so can you tell us just first of all, a little bit about what you're doing in Florida? Because this is a permanent move for you. Sure, yeah. Um, in deciding where and what I was going to meet, do next kind of a lot of things came into play and one of them was certainly wanting to be in warm weather and ridding myself of upstate New York winters. Um, but the other thing was being close to family and my parents at this point spend over half of the year in the Orlando area. And so seemed to make a lot of sense from that end of things. And another great thing about Florida that's a little bit different from New York is that you can do a wine bar and a wine shop under one roof. So my plan coming down here was was to do exactly that. With COVID, things have changed a little bit. Still going to head in that in the wine direction, as you can imagine, but specifically specifically going to focus on retail right now. Okay, and that wine shop's going to be in Orlando. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So everybody vacationing from the capital region in Orlando will be able to get natural wine because that's been your long-term focus and your award-winning wine lists at um, the Lucas Confectionery and Pex Arcade, you're gonna continue your focus on natural wine? 100%, yeah. Okay, all right. So can you, before we get into what is rosé and um, skin contact and a couple of other things that will differentiate, say, rosé from orange wine, can you tell us what you're drinking? I certainly can. So I am drinking a uh, rosé from, let's see, can we see it? Wrong way. Yeah. Okay. From Germany, from the Mosul area of Germany, actually. So um, it is uh, the grapes are a blend of Pinot Noir, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, I love this wine. I can talk more about it in a bit, but it just like it, every year, every vintage, I come back to it. It's always one of my favorites. Wonderful. Okay, I'm sure we will talk some more about it. So now jumping back oh, before we, I'll come back to you, but I want to find out what, uh, what Heather Dolan and Anthony are drinking over at Shaker and Vine so that I can toast you. And if anyone at home wants to pour themselves a glass of wine, please go ahead and do it and we'll toast you as well. So Anthony and Heather, what are you drinking? I am drinking, uh, this is Summer in a Bottle from Wolfer Estates from Long Island. That's originally where I'm from. 
okay. and raised. And this is a blend of nine different grapes, mostly Merlot and Cabernet and a Chardonnay amongst others. And uh, it's really refreshing. And it's a limited edition every summer. So it's kind of beautiful kind bottle of as well. Too. Gorgeous. Yeah, really pretty. Okay, and Heather, are you drink Heather Dolan, are you drinking the same thing? Oh, I chose one of our new wines that we have here, which is Stoby Rose uh, from Macedonia, actually. It's a brand new wine to me as well. I've never had anything quite like this one. Very floral, beautiful nose to it. Um, the two uh, grapes in it are Urcasatelli and Vranic, which is a grape that's indigenous to the Macedonia area. And it's really a fantastic, fun wine. It's got a lot of positive reviews here since we've had it um, in our wine machines. Great. And so that's a wine that people can have over at Shaker and Vine. I know that due to COVID, you're probably not doing your very unusual self-pour system, right? You, this, you're the first self-pour wine system in the area. But because of COVID, you don't want people touching it right now. Correct. So we people can order it by the glass and by the bottle. Exactly. Wonderful. Okay, well, before we cheers, I should tell you what I'm drinking. Um, so I have two wines on the go. I mean, I'm really only drinking one of them, but so I also, I chose uh, the Cote de Toul. Um, this is a Van Gris, which we can talk about as well. This means it had really just the slightest uh, contact with the skin of the red wine grapes. This is uh, Pinot Noir predominantly and um, Gamay Noir. I think it's about 85 percent, 15 percent split. But look at the color of this. This is so pretty and pale. And this is what we're seeing in terms of what people expect when they're thinking they're going to drink a rosé. But as we will get to, and clearly we won't get to all of these, but we'll show some of the color differences in all of these different uh, types of rosés. Um, I'll just mention um, that the other thing I have going on here so this is the one I just said. And this is actually an orange wine, but also skin contact. And I'm going to have Heather talk to us about this in a minute. But this um, has a very pretty color. And it, this one is called Sea Rosé, but it isn't a rosé. It's an orange wine because it's been left in contact with white wine grape skins. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So guys, thank you for joining. Cheers. It's great to have this conversation with you and uh, everybody cheers at home. And so, <laughs> cheers, I guess we should toast. So, um, Heather, after you've had your sip, what do we mean by rosé? When we're saying we're going to drink rosé? Yeah, so it can mean a couple of different things. Predominantly, most often, what you're drinking is a wine that's been made using grapes that are typically used to make red wine, but the skins are taken off the grapes er earlier during the fermentation process. So instead of a red wine, you're getting the, the pinky rosé hue. Okay. Um, there are a couple of other ways that it can be made. Um, one is in fact, and it's kind of, um, it, it's one that's definitely gaining popularity in the natural wine world, and that is, that is blending both red and and white grapes together. Um, so that would be another way that you can get a rosé. And it's funny you should say that because, you know, I've known people who thought, really believed that most rosés were in fact a blend of red and white wine, just kind of the white wine watering down the red wine, you know, but that's obviously not the way, but this is interesting, um, you know, in terms of sort of an ancient way of fermenting whole cluster grapes, whether or not it's red or white or mixing them together. Um, you're, you're right, that's an, a sort of a, an old method coming back into uh, popularity. And before we go too far with that, can you also just give us almost a sound bite because we could do a whole section on natural wine. But with mm -hmm. this whole piece today, we're not only focusing on natural wines, but we do have a number of natural or organic wines. So what, what do we mean when we talk about natural wine? I think uh, there are a couple of things to, first of all, I should say there are a lot of definitions for natural wine out there. So I'm going to kind of give quickly what it is to me. Um, at, the, at the most foundational or base level, the, the uh, 
grapes are grown organically or the winemaker is practicing organic. So most of the time, unless they're totally unforeseeable for circumstances, the grapes are grown organically. Um, and then the next thing that we don't think about a lot is if you notice um, on a wine label, we don't need to list the ingredients like we do with all of our other food or most of our other food. Um, and with wine, actually, you can have about 70 additives in a bottle of wine and it doesn't need to be on the label. How crazy is that? Yeah. But with natural wine, that's not the case. So natural wine, not only is the farming really solid, the winemaking is as well. There's nothing added to the wine. At times, a tiny bit of sulfur, but that's it. So no artificial colors, no artificial flavors, no other chemicals, which actually can be added in a commercial conventionally farmed wine. And those additives are really designed to stop the fermentation process, right? I think we've heard um, people call it like lobotomizing the wine, but that, that sounds more critical than it has to be. But, but the idea of sort of um, calling natural wine still living wines because mm -hmm. there's, still, there's still activity going on in the bottle, even, you know. Yeah, that's wine. certainly some of it. And then also like these artificial colors and artificial flavors, people, there are a lot of winemakers who are just in it to make money let's face yeah. it like a lot of our big wineries let's say in napa they're, that's their number one priority and with that comes consistency and so they want the wine to taste exactly the same from vintage to vintage to vintage right. Right. and these additives are what help with that perfect okay so um you know we've seen this uh huge trend obviously of rosé you know there was i guess i don't know maybe beyond 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, you know, I feel as if we all turned our noses up at, um, at rosé, or maybe because most of the rosés that you could get were pretty sweet, um, or at least maybe this is just what we were being served, right? There just wasn't such a breadth. Um, people were not making it on, on such, uh, in such quantities. And now, not only is it sort of the drink of summer, but you know, there are all of these celebrities who are making it from Bon Jovi to uh, Brangelina to, I think Mary J. Blige has her own rosé. I mean, like it's, you know. Um, yes, as of like two days ago, has one. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, Sarah Jessica Parker just launched one in May. Brandy oh. and her, yeah, she did too. So she's got her shoe line and her, and her rosé line, so. Right. We all need a rosé line. <laughs> okay, so we then have followed this orange wine trend. Um, would you say that orange wine is the new rosé? Mm. Possibly. I think that they're, to me, they're very different. And the reasons that I would grab one over the other, they're, they're, they're not the same. Um, but orange wine is certainly becoming popular. And in fact, it's, you could almost describe it as the, the opposite of rosé in terms of how it's made. So with orange wine, you're taking grapes that are typically, used, as you noted earlier, typically used to make white wine, um, rather than taking the skins off early, like you do with rosé, you're in fact leaving them on for a longer period of time, um, giving, which then gives the wine that orangey hue and also some qualities that enable the wine to drink somewhere in between a red and so you get some of that tannic structure, um, a little more texture that you might often find in a, in a, in a red wine, but in the, this orange wine. And, you know, that's a good, that's a great point, um, because this, this one that I'm drinking, this Van Gris, this has had the absolute least amount of contact with the, um, the skin, the red grape skin. So if we're talking a Pinot Noir or Gamay Noir, Sometimes the winemakers kind of get a two for one deal out of this because this is getting a quick squeeze and contact with, um, with the, the grape skins. And then they can take, they take off about 10% of the juice uh, and then they can take the rest of it and continue making red wine, but it's slightly more concentrated. So you get that really, really meaty, full bodied, you know, Pinot Noir. Whereas say, um, and, and I mean, this one, this um, this is orange wine, the the, the Binner import, the C Rosé. This is made with um, Gewurztraminer and Pinot Gris, but Gewurztraminer is a white wine grape, but it's naturally got a kind of a pinky hue to the actual grape skin. 
So it's very much in the process of the maceration, exactly what you're talking about, that it's had this long, long, long time spent and it has a far different, this has got way more complexity and body and texture. And, um, you know, this one, I feel it tells more of a story and has, you know, a lot more to it. Whereas when we talk about summery, light salmon pink rosés, this is just crushable. Like you could just drink this all day long, which is probably why it has the, the reputation that it does. So let's see, um, we're gonna talk a little bit. I, I definitely want to jump over to Anthony and the other Heather, but did you have a couple of comparison bottles you wanted to show us, Heather? Yes, and so, and I will note that one of the reasons I love the Uli Stein rosé um, is because it's a wine that I am happy to drink by the pool, but I'm, I also every year want it at my Thanksgiving table. So it has this really lovely acidity to it. Um, it dances on your palate. And that acidity for me is something great to go along with sort of the like fattier foods that you might have on your Thanksgiving table. Um, so literally for me, this is, this is, this is a year round rosé. It's not one that I just want to drink in the summer. Um, but then I have another example. It's a little bit darker. Um, this is 100% Carignan from California and Marin County. Um, it's, this is a little more full bodied, also great acidity, um, but a little more, slightly more luscious. Um, one thing I wanted to note with this, so this wine is a true natural wine, organically farmed, absolutely nothing added, including no sulfur added. And he loves to, I don't know if anyone, you can see it, but he loves to make a point that literally just grapes are in the bottle. Okay. Nothing so else you can add. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and then the last one that I brought just quickly, um, is a rosé champagne. Unfortunately, it's not in a clear bottle, so you can't see the color, but, uh, there is sparkling rosé champagne wine that is made in champagne. Beautiful. Okay, great. And, uh, if we get to it later, because I'm conscious of the, the time, but if we get to it later, I'll show you a couple of other colors. Um, I have a couple here that are made with Tempranillo um, and that has, you know, again, more of that kind of strawberry color um, and more of a spicy flavor. But the beautiful thing about all of these rosés is they're so forgiving. They do seem to go with all different types of food and you can very much kind of gear the rosé that you're drinking to the type of food. So the lighter it is, you know, you get more of that watermelon, cucumber, light, sometimes lemon zesty things and how you'll pair that with food versus like your Sangiovese or a Tempranillo and you're using those spicy, uh, warmer um, flavors. So I'm gonna jump over to Anthony and Heather and I'll kind of split it up because Anthony, you're also the co-founder publisher of Chilled Magazine, the industry drinks magazine. Um, so I, I'm considering you our trends guru. Um, so between, and this, both of you could speak to this, but what, between what you're seeing at Shaker and Vine in terms of how people are ordering and what they're looking for, and then perhaps what you know about in general from your industry um, publication, you know, what, what are you seeing? What, what are the rosé trends or who's drinking it? Who's sort of driving this interest in rosé? Well, um, rosé, I mean, a lot of people are thinking it's a millennial drink now, but I think uh, if you're just targeting them, it's a mistake. I really think you see the people who come in here, we have people 21 to 80 years old, and they're all drinking rosé. And I think Gen X, which I am, and uh, older generation, they're, they're all drinking it. You know, it's just, I think it's more of a seasonal type of, of wine than it is age-driven, you know? So... And, and Heather, uh, Heather Dolan? So I kind of agree with that. I do agree that we have that very big mix of people that come in and um, enjoy rosé from 21 on up age-wise. But I think um, we're seeing a trend of rosés kind of growing up themselves and people are taking them a little bit more seriously than they did before. Whereas, like you mentioned, people would think of a rosé as they would go into pink wines as white Zinfandel and all that. 
plush style sweetness that wasn't a serious wine. I tell my kids all the time, it's like their gateway wine when they're like, I drink white Zinfandel, my older kids. Um, <laughs> but, but it's kind of coming into its own right now and it's having more depth, more complexity, more structure, being, being able to age well and hang with the big boys, basically. So I think we're seeing that kind of go across the board and people are going to start to take rosé a lot more seriously than they do. I am remiss, Heather, in giving you your little uh, bio here. So you're the wine liaison and wine buyer for Shaker and Vine, um, but you have um, over 10 years experience both in the wine and spirits industry, level two sommelier and master whiskey certification. So we can also talk to you about cocktails and certainly rosé is increasingly popular as a base for cocktails. And I would be remiss in the middle of summer not to have you talk about Frosé. What are you doing with Frosé now that you're open to the public again on your patio? We actually just brought those up. So we have some two very nice frozen Frosés right now. Perfect timing, cheers. cheers. <laughs> yeah, so the Frosé, we have um, slush machines that we make these in. We actually use a uh, organic, non-GMO, um, gluten-free, vegan mix. It's called uh, Kelvin Slush. And uh, this is there actually, I found out about them because they advertise in our publication. Okay. And I love to give support back to people who support us. And it's just a great product. And you could buy this on Amazon. Anybody could buy this and make it in your blender at home. So... Is it, that's just the mix and then you're adding your yeah. rosé wine? We add just a house rosé and this mix and water. You could also add vodka to it, but uh, we did that a few times and I felt that it kind of takes away from the actual wine. So okay. um, it's just wine, this mix, it's a syrup and uh, water, that's it. And if people wanted to make some kind of rosé at home, obviously they can go down to Shaker and Vine and enjoy it on the beautiful outdoor patio overlooking the marina at the Mohawk Harbor. You're just a little bit further down than Rivers um, Casino. Yeah. Um, but what would you say if you're at home, um, get a mix like that, or you could just probably freeze your rosé for a short amount of time and make sort of a granita or a slushy or yeah it could be done like that as well um i think the the mix adds a little more flavor to it because once you freeze the wine i feel like it the cold the ice cold takes away from the taste a little so i think the mix right. helps a lot okay yeah that makes sense yeah. um now i know you have a very fun offering probably to appeal maybe i'm being judgmental but probably to appeal to a younger crowd you seem to have a a bucket of something for summer i'll show you that too right <laughs> this is a really fun, um, fun little thing we brought in Bollicini. It's uh, kind of going along with that new trend because now we see uh, canned wines being taken a little more seriously. Boxed wines were kind of coming into that same serious genre, but we have the canned uh, bubbly rosé, which obviously the cuteness factor of all of this is what really gets it. We got the fun little bucket. It's got the little pool cozy in there to hold your can while you're floating around in the pool for the summer <laughs> and a couple of funky little pairs of sunglasses that come along with it. So when we have our little, our buckets out there, they're getting all this little bling to go home with. And uh, we have a couple other flavors in here, but the rosé is one that is pretty, is pretty predominant and people really enjoy it. Wonderful. That's great. Now, are you, I know obviously you were closed during the shutdown and you have reopened and you do have this killer patio, but are you, have you restored food service as well? Or are you just sticking with drinks outside? Uh, no, we have, our, have about half of our menu available right now. Um, it's unfortunate. We, it, it's been real tough to source food. I think all the restaurants in the area opened at the same time. So it's been kind of tough to get I mean, suppliers were out, were out of chicken, out of uh, just all kinds of different items. And, uh, you know, it's been hard to source stuff. So uh, limited menu right now. We have our flatbreads, all of them. We have all of our salads. We took our paninis off for now. And uh, our desserts are off right now. But we're bringing our boards back. We have a cheese fondue board, um, our char charcuterie, and our chocolate fondue, which is delicious. Okay. Yes, your dessert boards are, are well known. Okay, great. Well, 
this talk of cans, this actually segues back nicely to Heather Levine. So we, over the last few months, we had a lot of uh, back and forth conversations worrying about these tariffs that, that were being potentially uh, levied on, um, on French wine. Well, they had the 25% import tax, and then it was potentially going to be up to 100% on all European wines. And we were all, you know, in a tizzy about uh, what would happen with that. That's a bigger conversation, which we can't really get into now. But one of the things was it sort of unfairly um, singled out wines of, of, of lower alcohol content, which impacted the natural wines. But it was also specific to the size in which it was being shipped, right? right. So it didn't affect if people shipped wine in large containers and then in the US put it in cans or even in boxes or however. So. I want to talk a little more about this canned wine trend. Um, I did stop by um, the, the wine store in Troy um, and saw that you guys also have some rosé in cans as well. Um, and we'll talk hopefully at the end about some other wine. This is from Superior Merchandise, but this is actually a combination. It's a Venus cider, so it's a blend of cider and wine. But all of this idea, you know, we're doing takeout, we're getting cocktails, you know, we're going to the park. Or, do you think this is a trend that's going to stay? I think it's incredibly convenient in certain situations, right? So probably, why not? Um, again, if you're going to the pool, it used to be if you were going to the track, um, sneaking it into the movie theater. Like, there are a lot of great reasons to have canned rosé, and they are now making canned rosé that drinks really well. Um, How's the quality? Any different? Well, I, mean I mean, you can, of course, there are always going to be uh, players in the game that are putting <laughs> out wine in a can, just like in any other situation. That's not so great, but you can also get really excellent wine in a can that's well made. And I think that's one of those things we've seen. We have all had to get over the idea of if your wine is a screw cap bottle, that was déclassé. Now we're all like, oh, screw cap, that's convenient. Um, in fact, this wine came with a really nice, you know, I, I, cut the, I cut the wrapper off, but it had a really nice little glass cork. And I was like, oh, I, I didn't expect it to have that. But again, we don't seem to be as hung up on packaging if we're getting something that we're happy to drink afterwards. So I have a few questions that have come in and um, I'm just gonna take a minute for us to get through those. Um, so a comment from Reba on YouTube, she was just um, telling us that she's drinking Domaine Ka Eugene, um, a fee, and just saying that it's lovely. So that's just a comment. Uh, thank you. And then we have Daniel on Facebook. Part of what I love about rosé and other whites, for that matter, is temperature. I defer to the experts, but it seems even red wine is supposed to be drunk at 60 or so degrees. And so often it's not. Whereas with rosés and whites, it's chilled. No argument. Full stop. Thoughts. Do we have a definitive position on temperature? I love my red wine with a little bit of a chill, specifically the lighter reds. Um, but it's kind of, and maybe it's being down here, but it's gotten to the point where I want a little chill on all of my reds. Um, and I always, in, in the wine shop at 22 Second, we would often tell guests, like, if you're buying a bottle of red wine, bring it home, put it in the fridge for 20 minutes or so and then take it out and drink it. Right, I saw, and Heather Dolan, were you going to add? I was actually gonna say the same exact thing that we always used to say that same thing about putting the reds in for about 15 or 20 minutes, but on the reverse side of that, taking a white out for 10 or 15 minutes before you serve it too, takes it down to that temperature where the flavor is gonna be the best. Sometimes you get a wine that's too chilled and it starts to lose all its flavor for you. Right. So you, you want to get that kind of optimal temperature. And let it breathe and let its character come out. Yeah, I, I you know, I tend not, if I've got a bottle of, I mean, these bottles here are beading all over my table right now, but I don't necessarily stick it right back in the fridge or just to keep it sort of completely iced. So what do we think about rosé? Should that always be chilled? Is that why we have this feeling that it's a summer drink, but you know, I'm hearing it's year round and certainly it's very forgiving with all different types of food. 
I, my personal I, opinion is to have it chilled. Sorry, Heather. Uh, my yeah, personal no. opinion would be to drink it it chilled um, with the, the, the chill on it. I just think the flavors really come out beautifully that way. Perfect. I agree, regardless of the time of year, I think. <laughs> okay, and then one last question here, which actually segues right in. So this is from Pat on Facebook. Rosé has become a year round wine. Uh, yes, chilled wines are refreshing in warm weather, but it depends on what you're eating right. So I, I think this is kind of twofold because um, my opinion on this is that I would choose some of the more chewy, fruity um, rosés that have more color and more texture for other foods. But, if, but again, these very light, you know, the Provençal style of these sort of very, very light um, rosés, those are the ones that we seem to want chilled regardless. If you're going to drink a rosé and have it, you know, like you said, with your Thanksgiving meal, um, you're not going to change the temperature of it. You're still gonna have that chilled, right? So we're, we're, we're basically all saying, yes, keep it chilled, but you, you really want to know what the grape varietal of your rosé is, because that's more indicative of whether it's going to be sweeter, watermelon, and well, not necessarily sweet. It could, most of them are off dry, but the flavors are more fruity or zesty or savory. Would you say that that's... I think that certainly plays a role in it. And then... It, along with the the grape thinking about where the wine the grape is coming from and so the the region the soil and all that play, plays into it often so for example um i love to drink uh island wines and specifically thinking about the canary islands and sicily so mount etna and you're getting into volcanic soil um and there's a note there that you often get with those wines. And it's a little more, even when we're talking about rosé, it's a little more savory. Sometimes it has a little bit of a smoky, ashy note to it. That's a great point. And then obviously the, the, the North Macedonian wine that Heather Dolan showed us, um, and I say North Macedonia because I think they renamed the, themselves in 2019 because Macedonia would be, um, is, well, Southern Macedonia is Greece. And there's Greek wine, but when we say Northern Macedonia, we're talking, um, you know, close to Albania and Kosovo and Serbia. So this is Eastern European. Um, so again, completely different soil, terroir. The, the very old vines, very long history behind the family making it. This this family is uh, these Sobi in particular. Uh, is a ruin now, uh, but that's the name of the vineyard based on the village that was next to it. Um, but they are like soil to soul kind of people making these wines. Like their their passion is making you feel where the wine grew up from right. and how it got to your glass. Not just let's put it in there and kick back some wine. They want you to know what it felt like from the time they put it in the ground till you're sipping it. It's beautiful to right. hear that kind of story and know that wine there. Well, and of course, in very recent years, I mean, reasonably recent years, you know, we have become much more familiar with the Georgian style the, and the wines that have been kept in Kvevri, the, the earthenware and the terracotta underground, you know, going back to what Heather Levine said in terms of some of the old traditional ways, you know, nat natural wine is, is not a new method of doing it. It's actually going back to the old way of doing it, not adding so many things. Um, but again, finding um, wine that's being produced by these very traditional methods, um, coming, bringing all sorts of different flavors, but having those, you know, if you've been to the raw wine fair or anything, you know, like being able to sample all of those uh, wines coming from different regions. Do you think that would, I mean, I have been trying to follow wine production in China, India, certainly in Central and South America, Israel, um, very often, like in Israel, they took um, vines from California that had come from the old world to the new world, and then they took them back to the old world to, to Israel, but they have fantastic old soil. So do you think we're going to see more and more uh, wine being produced in perhaps areas that we haven't 
seen before? Have you tried wines from any of these areas? I haven't got my hands on Chinese or Indian wine. <laughs> I, I haven't from there. I've, I've tried a few from other places around and I would love to see that. I would, I, lo I would love to see that be a trend where we're getting to try all these different things and all, all different wines from different regions. I think it would be a real treat to have that be a growing trend. And um, especially with things like the tariffs coming on and doing all that kind of stuff, us bringing stuff in from other parts of the world is probably going to be something we start doing here in the U.S. Uh, we had a um, question from Nancy on Facebook. She's asking, what is the name of the wine that you're mentioning from Northern Macedonia? Oh, it's Stobi, S-T-O-B-I, Stobi. Can, can you show us the label, perhaps? Great. So, okay, there you go, Nancy. And we can put this information, I think we can probably list some of these wines if just in case people are looking to try them afterwards. Um, so uh, let's see how we're we doing on time. Okay, so I, um, yeah, I'm gonna jump into something that I don't know how much you guys have been following or if you even stock some of these Venus cider wines. Um, this huge trend for fermentation, which seems to run the gamut, right? Everybody is fermenting, whether it's kombucha, non-alcoholic kombucha or um, kefir, or kimchi, you know, we're all interested in this. this is, and again, these are sort of traditional things. And I feel as if during the COVID shutdown, everybody was making their own sourdough starter and their own kombucha mothers. And I'm so impressed that everybody <laughs> has an entire new skill set. Um, but what we're seeing, and again, this ties directly into the natural wine trend um, with organic, biodynamic, regenerative farming, wineries, wine producers that are also harvesting apples. Um, and certainly in New York, you know, we have a fantastic collection of, of apple producers, incredible apples in New York State. And so I did just want to sort of tell people because if you like rosés, there's a good chance that you're going to like these Venus ciders. And um, Krista Scruggs is, um, she's the owner of Zaffa Wines and CO Cellar in Vermont. And then there's Wild Ark Farm in Pine Bush, New York. And both of these two are making some very interesting rosé ciders or cider rosé. And actually, I don't really firmly know if I should call it a cider or if it is a wine. It depends. I just wanted to give you an example. Um, so this one is, is Sweetheart. Can you see that? That's by, this one is from Wild Ark. And they became pretty famous because they were making piquette. And I know um, that Heather Levine was selling their piquette in the Lucas Confectionery. Um, and this is actually made by uh, fermenting Northern Spy apples on grape pomace, on grape must. So this, the, after they made their wine, they had all this wine skin left over and then they took their apples now, if you were making piquette, which is just the leftover, it's like the last press of your wine and you just add water to it. It's very drinkable. It's what the Romans used to give to their uh, field workers or I think, you know, like in the fields. Um, so this is absolutely delicious, um, sweetheart. And it is available in a number of wine shops all around uh, the capital region from I think Empire, um, to Kingston wine, to Troy. Um, but again, this is just something that's another pink drink, but it's um, dry, great flavor, completely a different creature than natural rosé, rosé by itself, but definitely something that people should know about. And I wanted to mention too, I mentioned Zaffa wine. So actually Felicity Jones of Superior Merchandise, she designed this label but Krista Scrugg she um she has been she, I think she's originally from California and she's moved to Vermont so more canned drinks that are rather fun Shaxbury and Zaffa collaborated so this is rosé cider um again the cider fermented on the rosé on the grape skins and this is more strictly a blend I believe of fermented fruit 
berries, cranberries, um, along with the cider and, uh, and the wine blended together. Do you anticipate selling this in, in either of your wine store, Heather Levine, or in, uh, you think this is something you might, might be the next trend? Um, I certainly loved, love Krista's work and love to support everything she does. So th the problem with what Krista does is there's so little of it, it's really yeah. hard to get your hands on. And I imagine particularly down here in Florida, it's gonna be a real challenge. Sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> she might be, it might be a lo localized, uh, a localized thing, but it certainly seems like it's a, a trend that's destined to be popular while we're all, you know, sipping. Did, did you say time. Empire distributes that? What's that? It, does Empire distribute that? Is that what I you think? think? They just, I think they distribute themselves. I think that uh, Zaffa Wines out of Vermont, they distribute by themselves. Um, and Shaxbury, I again, I'm, I'm not sure. I could find out for you, but um, something we would look at to bring in here. I mean, any yeah. kind of unique item we love, you know, just being this place is unique in itself. We just love to have different things that people come here strictly for that to try new stuff. So, definitely something we would look into. Okay, so a couple more questions. Um, yes, yeah, so for Anthony or Heather. Um, what is the alcohol content on your rosé? I assume it's just the alcohol content of that, the rosé that you're using. Whatever the wine is, whatever the rosé is, that's... I think that's almost 12.5. Our, our house rosé, yeah. yeah, it's probably around it's 12, 13. 12.5. Yeah. So around 12.5 or 13 yep. percent. And then um, secondarily, and actually we touched on this in the beginning, but we'll go back to it. Um, are there any quality rosé producers in New York State. Well, there are a lot of wine producers in New York State and we can talk about Finger Lakes and we can talk about Long Island, but you you, you were drinking yeah, uh, yeah. Wolf's Estate, right? right? We have Wolf Estate, you have so many out in the Finger Lakes. Right here, uh, close to us is Galway Rock. Uh, right. Ryan and Kate out there do a beautiful sparkling rosé. Yep. Saratoga Bubble, I think it's called, it's fantastic. Yeah, there's a lot of quality quality rosés in New York. And then, you know, there's the whole Show and Gunk wine trail. I mean, I think we could go on and on about New York wine, <laughs> but um, I would definitely encourage you to check out, um, this is Diane on YouTube. I would, I would encourage you to check out Wild Ark Farm. Um, certainly they're doing some very interesting um, work, but then again, these uh, estates down in Long Island agreed. I think we can put a little more information on that, but it's quite a, that's quite a large, There'd be a longer response to that question than we have time for. I only have two minutes left. So I first of all want to thank you guys for coming and chatting to me about Rosé. I hope that we have given people some thoughts. Um, I think we had another question about what specifically to eat it with. That's also a large conversation, but it, these wines are forgiving. They can go with so many different things. So thank you to all three of you for joining me. Um, and I just want to set up uh, that the next one of these um, sessions is going to be uh, July 28th, and I'll be talking about ice cream, but not just ice cream, we'll be talking about boozy ice cream. In Albany, we have boozy moo, and in Troy, we have the Dutch udder, and both of them are either making wine sorbets or beer-infused um, ice creams, and I will be making a, a traditional historical uh, boozy ice cream cocktail. So please join us for that. Um, and as always, you can subscribe to the Times Union and you will get my uh, Food Life newsletter packed with recipes and trends. And uh, we only have two more of these sessions. So please try and join us by signing up at the Eventbrite link. Thank you, Heather, Heather, Anthony. I hope I can see you all soon. Thank you. And uh, happy drinking. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.